Hi, this is how Prusa Research looks right now. Whole 9 floor factory occupied just by us. Our 410 employees, two huge warehouses, six filament lines, soon to be 13, public hackerspace on the ground floor and as of right now, over 100,000 original Prusa printers in the world. It's crazy. And here's how it all started. So here you can see my Mendel Remix. Uh, Z-axis is finally working. <laughs> yes, this is my voice in 2010. And that was the very first Mendel I've ever built. It may surprise you, but I didn't graduate from some hardcore technical university. I graduated from normal high school, and as with every parent, they wanted me to get a degree. So I enrolled at the University of Economics in Prague. As it happens, I had a lot of free time during my first semester, so both me and my brother Michael, we really got into DJing and building our own music controllers. I was looking for a way to make my own knobs and faders, and I was looking for so long until I found a RepRap project and Mendel 3D printer. As you may know, RepRap is a community project started by Dr. Adrian Boyer at the University of Bath and it kind of kickstarted the open source desktop 3D printing revolution. The basic idea is that a 3D printer could print as many parts as possible for another 3D printer and as a result, really decrease its cost. If you want to learn more about RepRap, Tom has a pretty cool video about it. But when I was building the original Cells Mendel, it was a bit complicated. You needed many different screw sizes. There were no slots for nuts and very few parts were pushed to fit. So I didn't just build it with the original parts. I started simplifying it and improving it on the way. And as RepRap is open source project, I started to share my designs uh, right away on my GitHub. The community quickly caught up with Prusa Simplified Mendel, yes, that's how it was called, and uh, started to use it over the original, now called Cells Mendel. But printers were missing one pretty important thing to have the ABS print successful. And that's heated bed. Without it, print just warp and deform away from the bed. This is the first prototype we've made, a resistance wire stuck between two sheets of acrylic. You can imagine, it didn't last very long. The second version used a tile instead of acrylics, which was better, but still it only reached about 90 degrees Celsius. Who knows how many Fahrenheit is that? After nearly six months of work, the PCB heatbed Mark I was done. My first real product I've ever created. It had 20 by 20 cm heated area and it could reach 110 degrees Celsius, more than enough for ABS and other high temperature plastics. I just checked and you can still buy it today in its signature red color. And you can see it on almost all desktop 3D printers uh, in its original form or in some simplified versions. I soon started to receive requests for printing the parts for Prusa Mendel. And I also organized a few build events where everybody built their own. I would still keep posting updates to the printer every week, and soon one printer was not enough for me. So I added a second one to be able to print the parts faster. By November 2011, there were so many changes that I named the release iteration 2, or i2 as you might know it now. And just a few months later, in February 2012, me and my brother Michael founded Prusa Research. It looks crazy from today's point of view, but at the time it was just two of us in the basement hacking together some Prusa Mandels. Founding a company, I wanted a permanent reminder of my roots in RepRap, so I got my open hardware tattoo. And the design is direct output of how Slicer would slice it. As we were selling the Mendel i2, I started to receive invites to a few very popular shows, and for example even TEDx Vienna. But man, <laughs> back then I was not a good speaker. It physically hurts me to listen to this now. Which made all this possible. Uh, actually, I will be speaking more about the 3D printing, but it's open source hardware project, so I guess it's okay. But jokes aside, these shows for sure really helped to kickstart the community in the early days when the general public had no idea what 3D printing is. And I was already working on the next iteration. Do you recognize it? This is the first ever print. I somehow guesstimated the e steps per millimeter and it <laughs> worked out quite well. There are a few things I need to take care of. For example, this funky extruder mount is not optimal. Also, somehow electronics detached, but it's not a big deal. Sanguino Lolo can take a lot of stuff. 
<laughs> so that was really the first print of the i3 design, which is now the most cloned design in the world. The wooden frame was quickly replaced with the metal one, and the whole design was quickly shaping up. By the way, did you notice the hot end? Turns out those were pretty expensive and difficult to get at the time, so I made my own. And I wasn't the only one with the problem, so I got a fair amount of orders for that hot end. Funny thing is, we didn't have any eShop or anything like that. We just had our email and phone number on our webpage, and that's about it. So someone would just call us ordering a frame, we would pack it in a pizza box and send it to him. At the beginning of 2013, we started to ship the nozzles and frames worldwide. I also stopped being so damn nervous at my talk, so they became much more fun. You know, it's really bizarre because last time I was in this room, I was sitting in the, in the uh, classroom and I was listening to some economics classes. So it's really satisfying to show uh, this here. But this one even changes color if you, if you touch it and... <laughs> well, uh, later that year, in October 2013, we got our first employee, Hanka. Hi, Hanka! We got our print farm running, you know, the whole five printers. We gave them names. Uh, Stan, Kyle, Cartman, Kenny and Butters. And by the way, you can see Kyle for yourself in front of the entrance to the Prusa Lab. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Back to the Stone Age of 3D printing. The basement where we were had these street level windows, which was actually really great. We could pass the boxes to the delivery guys through the window without going all the way up. And remember that the i3 was running on 3mm filament and it didn't have any screen to control it. We would sell about 5 of these a week and each Friday we'd do a seminar how to use it. In the spring of 2014 we finally moved from a basement to a flat just a few streets away. And I got my dog, Buddy. He became one of the symbols of the company. He's one of the bundled sample objects and we even have cute Buddy stickers that we include with each printer. Later that month, of course, while partying in a club, I met Andre. It's funny, because Andre's surname is also Prusa, but we are not related in any way. This keeps confusing people to this date. Anyway, Andre and I instantly clicked, and he had a company providing tech support, which was a perfect combo. He brought some more employees to the company, and we were working hard on the Prusa i3. In February of 2015, I launched prusaprinters.org, a help for everyone with Prusa Printer and for other rep rappers. I posted a few interviews there with well-known members of rep rap community and few tutorials. But at the time, I would have never imagined how great it will become. We were growing and the flat was just too small for us. So it was time for first actual office. The choice fell on a building in Prague neighborhood called Karlin in an inner courtyard on the ground floor. Come, let's take a look at it. Okay, so the whole production easily fit into this room with the printing farm situated right next to it. And there was a room for development, room for support, and for the first time I actually had my own office. Well, together with Andre, of course. The Prusa team had about 15 members, so there was plenty of space for all of us. We expanded the farm to 16 printers, so managing it would be a full-time job. To avoid that, each printer was running on Octoprint, and I managed to run four instances of Octoprint on a single Mars board. And using the API, I was pulling the data to a tablet app I made, so that there is minimal downtime on the printers. The first big release came in June of 2015, the original Prusa i3 kit. It included all the tools you need for assembly, an LCD screen so you don't need to control the printer with a PC, original Rambo board from Ultimachine, all the wiring already prepared with connectors, labels with one-to-one -one representations, awesome manual. Uh, last but not least, we also include one kilogram of ABS. Well, basically something you are used to by now, but at the time it was unheard of in this price range. For about two months it was still using 3mm filament, so that's what we call Mark Zero now. But Soon we switched to 1.75 using hotends from E3D and that's what we call the Mark 1. Up to this point the number of orders was growing gradually, but now it was basically exponential. By September 2015 we were shipping 100 printers each month. And by the way, around the same time the Prusa i3 design was officially the most used 3D printer in the world. The print farm grew to 40 printers, 
15 employees became 30, and by March 2016 we were shipping 500 printers a month. We were spreading and pushing other companies out of the building. Sorry guys. The storage room was captured and the farm got more space. However, the big storm was just about to come. In May of 2016 we released the original Prusa i3 Mark II. It got awesome reviews and reached top positions in the charts. Orders for the new Mark II suddenly flew up and for our production it was mostly about catching up with the numbers. There was two months waiting time, but still, the number of orders wasn't falling. We had to spread our production, our team expanded as well, and we occupied the whole ground floor and some adjacent space. As we improved the printer's firmware and hardware, we also had to push the slicer development, or, or, or is it Slick 3R? Anyways, at a higher pace. As a result, in October 2016, we created our own fork, uh, which is called Slicer Prusa Edition, with Vojta leading the development team. By the Christmas of 2016, there was about 60 of us. Even though we had three printing farms, we just couldn't meet the orders. It was still not enough. Well, when talking about printing farms, it was about 100 3D printers, right? It's significant electricity consumption. And do you remember the flooding in 2002? No? Well, there was a huge flooding in Prague and Karlin was heavily hit. Since then, the electric network had not been stable in our building. Well, we had no idea about that. And what do you think happened when we plugged more than 100 printers at once? As you have guessed, we blew up the fuses. Even a single day of downtime is too much for us. We want to get the printers to all of you as soon as possible. So while the electrical wiring was being replaced, our production was running off a diesel generator. It looks crazy, but it worked. And we ended up using it for a whole month. We had to manage a bigger business, so we needed more people. Software and hardware developers joined the team. This is Alex. He's the mastermind behind many of our products like the Mark III or the Multimaterial Upgrade, which we first released in May of 2017. And he has a thing for sheep. Nobody really knows why, but he just keeps printing them. So during the MMU testing, there were just sheep everywhere. We also got process managers, purchasing officers and a lot of other positions were assigned. With this tempo, we couldn't fit into the building much longer. We even had problems with the logistics. As I said before, the office was located in an inner courtyard. All the goods had to go through this tiny passage. No bigger truck could pass. So all the pallets had to be brought manually to the street and trust me, our delivery guys just loved it. Last month before moving, just being in the office was insane. And the corridor was covered with boxes. Just imagine all the Mark II's that were made in this tiny space. Crazy, right? So, we had to move. The choice finally fell on building in Holoshevice. It's still a city center, accessibility is great, it's right next to tram stop, metro, bus stop and a train station. Yes, this building is old, but it's huge and it was completely empty. Well, the new warehouse needed a few adjustments. But guess what was the biggest fun? We have an awesome new forklift. We built the new printing farm with 200 Mark IIs. Well, you can see that they have removable beds. Yeah, we were already testing those. Our production got tons of space, so we could finally work on optimizing it. To be honest, we thought the building is way too huge for us. We only occupy the first three floors, even though that there are seven floors above the ground and three more underground floors. Well, one of those floors is an old war shelter, but that's the cons, right? At this point, we had pretty much everything under our control. We designed the hardware, electronics, software, print settings, and even the firmware. 
but there was still one big variable that has a huge impact on the print quality and that's filament. And with the trend of looking for cheap materials we couldn't expect that manufacturers will improve the quality of their products. So now that we had enough space for it, we ordered our first filament line. We even bought an extra long one with two bars for gradual cooling. We released Prusa Control, which was a parallel to Slicer PE for newcomers to 3D printing. We don't update it anymore, but I really liked it and it was a great test of how simple user interface can work. So we moved a lot from it to Slicer and now Prusa Slicer. But I'm sure you know what was about to come next. In September of 2017, we released the original Prusa i3 Mark III. With the new and expanded production, we thought we were ready for the first wave of orders. Well, oh well, I think we did really well. It was the smoothest product launch. But still, the factory was working at an insane tempo to keep up with the demand. I met a new employee almost every single day. In October, we made over 5,000 printers and the team grew to 170 people. We were the third fastest growing tech company in the Central Europe. The reviews started rolling in and it was really hard to push the lead time down. We had to expand our printing farm so that the printed parts wouldn't become a bottleneck. It grew all the way to 300 printers. And it took us all the way to June of 2018 to get the lead time down to just a few days. And here I have to mention the powder coated sheets. Don't get me wrong, the smooth PEI sheet is great, especially for PLA. But the textured one is simply the best sheet for 3D printing. Sadly, we made nowhere near enough of them for the Mark III launch. What sucks even more is that we tested them for over a year on the farm. It was only when we wanted to make a lot of them, and I mean thousands, with perfect quality that we suddenly encountered one problem after another. We ended up building our own testing lab to make sure that the sheets will survive PTG and even flexible filaments without the texture peeling off. We have no planned obsolescence for our products. So just like with previous models, after releasing the Mark III, we made upgrade kits. Mainly the 2.5 upgrade is really cost efficient way to get most of the Mark III features so everyone can get it. But of course we made even full upgrades. So technically, if you really wanted to, you could upgrade the original Prusa i3 Mark I kit all the way up to the Mark III S. There was a lot happening in the factory at the same time. One whole floor was completely rebuilt and reserved just for Prusa Mand. We got four more filament lines and we started to create filament for our print farm. There was another project that I wanted to do for a long time. When I was young and started tinkering, it was really hard to get all the tools and living in the city, space was also a problem. So for months we've been rebuilding the ground floor and in June 2018 we were ready to open Purcellab, a fully equipped community maker space. There is also space for presentations and we have free classes each week. And just like when it was just me and Michael, we still have 3D printing classes every Friday. By the way, getting the machines down here was pretty crazy. The only opening big enough for the CNC or the router was through the ceiling. So we had to use uh, the warehouse crane and slowly lower it down. But it all worked out in the end. Oh, and there's a tap beer in Prusala. So it turns into a cool party place from time to time. And if you are traveling through Europe, I would love if you stop by. We can show you the print farm and also the workshop. We were already in seven floors and there was over 250 of us. And as the main partner, we brought the Maker Fair to Prague for the first time. We showed the Multimaterial 2.0 in there, our upgrade which lets you print with up to five filaments at once. And two months later, we started shipping it. By this time, it was already a year since we got our first filament line. Now, with five of them running and with all the real-time monitoring and perfect winding figured out, we released Prusament. We over-engineered the hell out of it. We target 20 micron tolerance using a two-axis laser, but as you can see, most pools are actually even more precise. We measure and adjust the color in real-time and anything out of spec is instantly discarded. 
And since we store all the data for every spool, we thought, <laughs> why not make it public? So you can check your spool online and see just how perfect it is. The number of orders for Persimmon was overwhelming. It's another product that's always instantly sold out. So we do have more lines on back order for the total of 13. But they are pretty complicated pieces of hardware, so it's gonna take us some time to get them modified and running. With the help of robots, we want to achieve a non-stop production. Except for parties. Robots party with us as cool bartenders. And if you think it's getting a bit crazy with having Prusa in all the names, I sometimes feel the same, but it's branding and we like to have some fun with the names. And more often than not, we keep the working names because everyone gets simply used to them during the development. So here's that. What I didn't tell you is that in March of 2018, we started working on our first SLA printer. We didn't start from scratch, not at all actually. The SLA team is led by Jiří Posledník, who has been developing SLA printers for almost seven years, and he had his own company creating them. But being a small company, they had problems with things like sourcing the parts in small batches for a reasonable price, and other problems I encountered as well when I was starting out. But now, being a part of Prusa family, it was different. We took what worked on their printer as a starting point, mixed it with our ideas and polished it for a whole year. And the original Prusa SL1 is the result of this work. With all the Prusa men's pools and parts for the SL1, the warehouse, just like the currently occupied floors, hit its limit. So we filled the last empty rooms, but what's cooler is that we managed to rent this building as a secondary warehouse. It's gigantic, but also beautiful. And as a matter of fact, it's a building where the first Prague power plant used to be. So we have enough space for all the Haribo bears in the world. When we were starting out, we wanted to ship something extra as a thank you gift for the order. And maybe also to make the first customers a bit more tolerant to our small mistakes here and there. And we just sort of stick with it. Years go by and we are still doing it today. They are a great way to keep your energy levels high during the assembly. With about 160,000 packages that include them, that 16 tons of Haribo bears shipped. Just to give you some scale, one pallet has 450 kilos on it. So 16 ton is the whole side of the pallet rack full of Haribos. Near the end of the year 2018, we had to expand the print farm even more to a whopping 500 printers. And we reached over 1,000 packages shipped per day, including printers, upgrades, filaments and replacements. We ship them to over 160 countries around the world. To me, it's mind-blowing that you can zoom on almost any island in the middle of an ocean and you'll find a couple of Prusa printers in there. Funny thing is that for a long time we managed orders to all of these countries with just Google Documents. We had sheets for everything and it was actually pretty crazy. We had some problems whenever Google did maintenance on their servers. Well, now obviously we have our custom solution, but these were fun old times. With 500 farm printers, you might wonder, how does the current farm management look like? Imagine just flashing the firmware to all of them manually. So we have all of them connected with a serial to network adapter, and we have our own software to control them. We can see the current status for each printer, remotely start a print from an SD card or flash the firmware. It's uh, slightly better than running for instances of Octoprint on Mars board. It may seem crazy, but even with 1000 packages a day, we still test every single part. Not just a sample from each delivery or each box. No, really, we test everything. This is the part of development that you don't get to see much. We create our own testing stations and sometimes they are really fun like this MMU tester that presses each of the buttons to see if they work. <laughs> we have Pindo testers that heat them up and test their measurings. We have testers for our power supplies, fans, heat beds, filament sensors. And we have these massive test stations that test the printer as a whole. Everyone gets a testing protocol with their printer, which is something I think that still nobody else does. Well, even with this ridiculous amount of testing, you can avoid some replacements, and that gets us to our support. We've always been praised for it, so how does it look with that many customers? 
In the spring of 2019, we now have 45 people. Uh, Jacob is leading the team and he's with us since the beginnings in Carlin. We have over 12,000 live chats in nine languages each month, but still we are keeping the chats with negative rating below 1.6%. But we are still doing our best to make everyone happy. And the most legendary live chats make it to the wall in front of the support. The community, well, that's you guys watching this video, has always been so important to me. I try to go to as many shows as possible. Just look at this map of all the shows we attend. It's always so refreshing to talk with our fans face to face and hear about the awesome projects that came to life with the help of our printers. The vast majority of printers we sell are kits, over 80% actually. So everyone learns how to build the printer and get much better understanding of how it works. I like to think that we are raising a generation of makers who can create and fix things instead of throwing them away. And by the time you are watching this video, we've already released a new platform for our community. Wouldn't it be nice to have a map with other users nearby offering support or printing? So you can ask them for help or just invite them for a beer? What about a database of not only models, but also perfect G-codes ready to be printed? Prusa printers is something we've been secretly working on for a long time and I'm so excited that it's finally out. We have a big plans with it and we'll be adding features over time, but already it's the go-to website for the Prusa printer owners. I would have never imagined that this is where we'll be in just a few short years when I started. We got literally from hacking together printers in a basement to this level. Thank you, everyone, who supported us on our journey. We would not be here without you. We'll continue our mission of pushing the 3D printing technology further for everyday people. And as always, happy printing. <laughs>